I drive my car up to the lake As if there's someone to awake I haven't been to bed for days I live in a twilight haze And I set my heart to the setting sun And I hope that no one else has done it And the drinks are never far Open up the bar We have quite a few homeless people that come in here as well, actually. Um, so, just as a way of introduction, so, um, Stuart, welcome to the podcast. You're here from Kairos, and um, for those of uh, the people that don't know what Kairos is, um, you're a sort of an organisation that comes around the central city, or this is certainly how you started, um, comes around the central city and visits cafes, picks up the food that would otherwise go to waste and um, takes it back to a location and distributes it, distributes it sort of amongst um, people that need it. Yeah? Yeah, yeah yep. that's correct, yeah. It started by Beth Hutt, who was a cafe manager in the city, been in cafes for 10 yeah. years, and literally uh, one way on... D- Tipped out the food at the end of the day from the cabinet into the at the rubbish bin. Yeah, and on her way home, walked past some people, started talking to them, and realised that they were hungry was one of the issues for them. And just yeah. what we call it as a Kairos moment, a unique and opportune moment. Yeah, thought, hang on, why am I throwing this really good food out? Yeah, when people on the street need it. That's right. Mm-hmm. Look, I've worked in hospo for ages, and it's something that I always did and, you know, all the different cafes, we, we would always do that. There was a stage when I started sort of packaging it up, taking it home, but there's only so many, you know, muffins and freons that one can eat um, <laughs> before, you know, you start feel like you're turning into one. Um, yeah, and I would, I sort of kind of did the same thing, but I've, obviously I didn't take that, that step further, but I do remember um, handing out some uh, blue cheese sandwiches to some tramps um, occasionally, don't know if they like them or not. <laughs> it's always, yeah, a bit random. But yeah. who knows? The hardest thing is sometimes you get food in, you've got no idea what it is. Yeah, because we haven't literally been the ones selling it, so the labels aren't on it, and it's quite quite interesting at yeah. times what people end up with. <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's nice. I like that though. <laughs> hey, um, so now you're shifting. Like over lockdown, things kind of changed for you. And you are now shifting, what, five tonnes of food a day, I wrote down, of unwanted food. So talk us through, like, a week for you. How do you, how does that um, operate? Is it still at five tonne a day, or is it kind of... Um, so last, so there's two parts to it. So we've still got our free store. We still run around, pick up all the food from cafes and that sort of thing. Mm. That's a really important part, and then we hand that out at the moment on Wednesday and Friday nights from our container Yep. in Sanasa Street. Yeah. We've also got a warehouse uh, that we get food in bulk. So we've got a yes. forklift, trucks yep. turn up, yeah. food comes in, and then it gets shifted out to a lot of the food banks around the city, some preschools, uh, different places as well right. that are, have turned into uh, food banks because families are turning up finding they're struggling. Mm. So okay. last financial year, we shifted just short of 300 tonne of food in about 87 Far square metres of space. So, yeah. yeah, about three times the size of your calf is the yeah. space we operate in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So we're looking at a uh, bigger space because we just yeah. can't keep that up, that level uh, yeah. in that space. Because I think it said that your first um, thing was like heaps of tin tomatoes. 27 pallets of tin tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never counted individually how 27 many 27 pallets is a huge amount. What was the matter with those tomatoes? <laughs> Nothing was wrong. It was just yeah. short date. Each pallet was like 900 kgs. So it was, yeah, nine, and just, yeah, just short of a ton yeah. each pallet. So. so nothing was the matter with it, but it was short dated. Short dated. And, so. and, and as you know, canned food, you know... Um, Sometimes dates actually really they're put there by manufacturers and different reasons. But yeah, they, tin tomatoes ain't going to go off. <laughs> no, that's right. So, yeah, full on. Mm. That's it. that's exactly right. I didn't. Even, I don't even think I was aware that there was a date on a tin. <laughs> but you know, yeah. far out. Okay. The worst one is tins with no labels on. Trying to work out the code and Google the code of what's actually in it. Is oh, it a, okay. Uh, yeah. Is it a tin of pears or is it a baked beans? Or <laughs> yeah. Do you? My first job out of high school was working in the Waddies canned distribution warehouse. Yep. Um, and it came in by rail from Hastings, and occasionally 
the rail would get shunted. Like it would, the, the, the trucks or whatever they were called would get shunted and all yep. of the pallets would just get switched across yeah. and damaged down one side of the um, pallet. Right. And it was my job to sort through all of these damaged tins yep. and chuck them in bins and then they got packaged up. Mainly staff were buying these kind of large boxes. Yep. Um, so do you guys get stuff like that? Are you and yep. Have you got a relationship with those guys? Diff- uh, it's, but it's changed a lot since... It's changed a lot. There's, yeah. there's a number of things that happen in that landscape, um, but we often do. So some food warehouses, large food distribution warehouses, say a forklift drive past, clips the corner of the pallet, dips yeah. six or seven cans, tomatoes burst over the cans. Mm. Some food warehouses won't even clean that up because they go, we haven't got staff time, haven't got yeah. place to clean it up. Literally get the phone call, come pick up the whole pallet. Oh, right. So then we have to clean down Flat. that. They yeah. write the whole pallet off. Um, other times you get half a pallet because yeah. that's, they've kept the half. The yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it just depends on different organisations. Some, as you say, sell it to their staff or mm. some donate to other food banks and different things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. That's intense. It's, mm. it, does it, was, do you, were you aware of any of that wastage before... No, no. I mean, the most classic one we had one time was um, someone labelling the food instead of roast beef, had labelled it roast biff. Oh, right. And they didn't (laughs) sell the whole lot. We got all donated. Like, this this is roast rumps, like expensive. Roast rumps. Oh, and it was just like the sticker that they stick on it. But it was all part of the pack. It 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 wasn't wasn't a label that was stuck on it, it was printed, but it was called roast biff. Yeah. Well, um, me and some of the other people were very pleased with the guy that labelled it wrong. Yeah, man. <laughs> that was an inside job, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was. <laughs> I want to. I want to find him again to arrange it yeah, again. <laughs> He's a hero. <laughs> so previously, all that food that say was mislabeled or whatever, would have that just been thrown out? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, some companies have policies about what they can and can't do with food, and it comes mm. down to the individual thing. But obviously, a lot of companies are really moving towards trying not to waste food that is edible or that sort of thing. But yeah. also, some companies want to protect their brand, yeah. so they don't want people to know that they've thrown out a whole That's lot of rubbish. That's right. Tip. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a stat in Auckland: half of the rubbish in a, a household's rubbish bin mm. is, is is food yeah. waste. So that that's huge, you know, just that's in insane. a domestic level. Yeah. But when you get into a, um, a national of, and national global and, yeah. and, and, and industrial level, mm. it's mm. it's you know even uh, uh, there's companies that make muffin mix. Yeah. Um, we often get you know big twenty kgs of muffins. Muffin mm. mix, and the, there's just a little hole, and it's yeah. not bigger than my finger. Yep, and they write yeah. it off. Well, you put cellar tape over it, and you can still give it to a group. They can still use it. And, oh, totally. You know, there's yeah. nothing wrong with it. It's no. not tainted or damaged. No, but yet that would be thrown out because it's just too hard for that company to actually. Yeah, yeah, and it's the food safety standards and all that type of jazz and things. Yeah, it's pretty full on. I know that that type of wastage and craziness goes on in the fashion industry and I've heard of companies like upmarket labels in New York um, rather than sell their clothes on discount they'll just chop them up and dump them in the bin and uh, people find like you know a thousand pairs of jeans with the legs chopped off so no one can kind of use them um, so yeah that wastage There's a is a company in Christchurch industry. that uh, they find it cheaper to turn clothing that goes into some of the clothing bins yeah into rags, they make more money than selling it back to mechanics and things. Then they can actually try and sell it as second-hand clothes. Yeah, yeah. Though some people think their clothes are recycled. They are, but yeah. into rags. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. And yeah, that's right. The market's a bit skewed in some ways yeah. with that sort of thing. Yeah. At least it's getting used, I guess. Mm. Hey, um, I actually forgot to mention on the podcast about Richard being there behind the camera for the for the people that are watching it. <laughs> <laughs> so Richard's from Seven Sharp, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, he um, is just doing a wee story on. Uh, Semi bags. Yeah, you're not going to join us every morning, are you, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> no, cool. Hey, um, so, um, so yeah, a large part of your job is sorting through that food, and then you have a relationship with some of the other um, organisations that exist out there that kind of have been known to do the job that you guys are doing. Um, and you actually sort of hand the food over to them as well and they distribute amongst their groups of people. 
Yeah, so we've got most of the food banks in Christchurch working together. Yeah. So for See, example, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, we've got a, a, a map and things. And so, for example, if I had four four crates of broccoli and I yeah. can't do anything with it at the end of yeah. the day, but it's still good, but it needs mm. to be moved, Yeah. Uh, we put it in the app. And yeah. one of the other groups go, yeah, we can use it this afternoon, and we make an mm. arrangement to get it to them or they come and get it. And it's just been smarter, and it's also working in our different areas of the city that we're based in. Right, so it's so kind of like distribution channels, yep. right? You've yep. got pre-existing distribution channels, which you can... Um, yep. Because Kairos kind of, yeah, popped up, and I was kind of thinking, well, surely that must sort of already exist to a certain degree, although... No one was really doing cafe food, I think, when Beth started, that's right. and that yeah. was the key yep. key factor around that. Mm. Um we just saw, and our, our name uh, is, is in Greek, Like mm. so Kronos is your sequential time, one, two, three, four, five on yep. that watch, whereas Kairos is the same sort of language, but it's unique and opportune moment. Yeah, and yeah. so during the lockdown, the very first lockdown, we just saw an opportunity that some things weren't happening very well, and mm. literally food started turning up. Um, a, a bakery in Christchurch, Grizzly Bakery, mm. for example, saw what we were doing and just jumped on and said, hey, if you buy a loaf of us today, we're not going to deliver it because we're in lockdown, but we'll make a loaf and add another loaf to it for you guys to distribute out. Oh, cool. So they were getting the public to sponsor them, yeah. making two loaves yes. for the price of one, and yep. that was going out in our food parcels. And if you know about the amazing bread that they make, yeah. um, that was going in people's food parcels yeah. to their houses. Fantastic. So it wasn't just yeah. rescued food at that time. No. But... It was just coming together and pulling people together and yep. all their own areas and being able to do something. And yeah, that yeah. was 60 to 70 food parcels a day delivered around the city. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah. Mm. During lockdown as well. But what we realised, the problem was happening was that um, our van would drive up the driveway and, and drop a food parcel off. And as that back down the driveway, the city mission van just about crashed into the back of it, crossing a parcel off. And somehow they got Uh, around each other. And then the Salvation Army van went up the drive. And we started realising that some houses Mm. were getting three or four food parcels. Mm -hmm. And so we, that's when the group really came together across the city and we started Started going, how can we do this better? How can we... uh, Make sure that you know resources get to everywhere they need to be, rather than just the one spot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, and it's it's so cool that there is that open uh, dialogue and communication, and you kind of work together and stuff. Even though, I mean, yeah, obviously there's not going to be competition, but um, yeah. So um, the price of food is like at a pretty much an all time high. Are you noticing? You know, and not to mention fuel and the other, all the other stresses of uh, modern life. Um, Is the coffee going up? <laughs> it should be. Yeah. It should be. Mm. I read an article about it the other day. The seven dollar, uh, the seven dollar coffee, and um, yeah, it's a, it is, it's a man. It, it drives me kind of crazy. I don't know. <laughs> We, yeah, what happens is we often just absorb the costs and that $4 coffee uh, or $4.50 coffee just stays the same for flipping decades. Um, so, yeah, our, our roasters have put out their prices up recently um, and for good reasons and stuff. So, um, I don't know. As a business owner, I kind of like to hold on for as long as possible. But, um, yeah, that is... Um, that's a scary thing because I, I know there's a breaking point and there's a tipping point and it's trying to read your customers as to where they're at. Mm. Um, so, yeah, possibly. Mm. But um, so, do you, you're noticing more people get yeah, food? Look, we're, or? We're, we're starting to, and I mean, it, when we give food out, we don't mm. ask any questions. We are completely non judgmental. Yeah. Who you are, where you're from, what you believe, and all that sort of thing. Mm. Any, anyone is welcome. You know, we yeah. have a whole lot of people come from. Um, people who do live on the street or associated with the street uh, from gangs right through to there's a lawyer that comes down sometimes so we get yes, the whole, whole mix yeah. um, but we're starting to see a lot more families come in mm-hmm. and these families have heard about us via Facebook or some other way or connection from someone else Yeah. and what we're starting to see with those families is they've never had to ask for help Oh yeah. they've never known that there's another agency out there that can help them in some shape or form, they didn't even know <coughs> Rescue Food existed, they don't yeah. even really even know about the City Mission and Salvation Army because they've been sort of insulated all their life Wow. and they're starting to realise that just the, the money coming in is not equaling what's going out, it's going yeah. out faster than it's coming in Yeah. and so just 
and talking with them and just letting them know about what other places are there that can help them. You know, one person didn't even know they could get working for families. Mm. Um, and so we're seeing a lot more of them. And, and they're just the, the real, true mum and dad, um, without sounding a bit boxy in it, but they're the true mum and dad that have just yeah. both worked, um, that's been enough to come in, but now, you know, they're making decisions to show my kids go to sport or not. Yeah. We won't do that activity mm. on the weekend, or we'll only do it once a month now. You know that yeah, you can, yeah. they're just starting to make those hard decisions because everything else is going up. Yeah, mm. no, you're right. And what's that like? Like that transaction? Is it kind of uncomfortable or like a? How, how do you? Obviously, there's a bit of an atmosphere at Kairos. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you're obviously warmly greeting all of these kind of people in. Um, it sort of it flows all well and stuff, and people kind of once they get to know you, they feel more relaxed and stuff, and it's a nice, warm, inviting. Yeah, I think they find it really hard, like um, the sort of that pressure on themselves to come to something like that because they yeah. know that they need it. Yeah, but actually to walk into that place is mm. such a hard thing because yeah, it yeah, sort of yeah. almost admits defeat. It means mm. they haven't got it right. Yeah, and I, you know that they've done everything that they. When you yeah. really talk to them, they're breaking. They just don't know what the other options are, and yeah. and they don't want to go into more debt. They've already mm. got a little bit on the credit card. They've already put last week's groceries on the credit card, and yeah. they just they just can't go any further. You know. Yeah. So where do you where do you guys get your sense of duty from? Like what inspires you and sort of drives you yep. to have I think Beth was definitely driven by. Um, she had that moment where she met these people who were hungry, but for mm. her it was about the, the food going in the bin was her sort of bigger yeah. drive to it. <clears throat> Whereas for me, I think for me it's more the people. Yeah. You know, I just um, love people. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. And I've walked through different things in my life, and yeah. um, people have always helped me out or given me a second chance or a second opportunity. Mm. And so um, for me... Just giving people what I call a hand up, not a hand out. Yeah. If we're handing out free food, if, if we said Pilgrim Cafe's got free food tomorrow, yeah, yeah, you'd yeah. see the queue out the street. Yeah. But but should we do that, Norm? <laughs> yeah, this sounds like a good idea. Yeah. We've should never we? had a queue out the street. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> doesn't do much for the profit nah. line, actually. Yeah, you're right. But um, but if we if we talk about a hand up, and what I yeah. mean by that is is some of these families coming in, and I said before they just don't know any more. They've done everything they can do. Yeah. We've managed to connect some of them with uh, agencies that are budgeting services and mm. things like that. And it just gives them a different idea from someone external looking at saying, hey, have you thought about looking at a different power company? Because mm. this power company might be better than the one you're with. Yeah. And let's look at your budget and let's pull it yeah. apart. And do you know you can get this accommodation supplement? Do you mm. know you can... Because those people know, you know what they can get. So what I... I call that a hand up. So yeah. through food, we've met someone, yes. and now we're giving them a hand up. And yeah. if, you, if you go to the City Mission or Salvation Army and get a food parcel from them, you'll only get so many until they say, we want you to engage in our services. And that's when you go into the budgeting program or other things like that, which is great, because otherwise people just turn up, get your free food all the time, mm. and won't partake. So we don't have a, a set rule, you've got to be engaged in something, but what we do is we really encourage people through the relationship we've built yeah. to get them into some of those <clears throat> other things. And we've had some real success stories of families that have come through, people have come through, and don't come to Chorus anymore, mm. because they don't need us anymore. And to me, that's a success. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that reminds me of the, that old saying, um, I'm going to butcher it probably, but um, you know, uh, give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, yep. teach him how to fish, <coughs> feed him for a lifetime type of thing. Yeah. I think, um, yep. Milton, and it was it you that said that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate, that was me. Yeah. yeah, it was a good one. A wise guy I once yeah, yeah. knew. <laughs> Um, yeah, so how do you feel about that? So there are ways it does it does translate over to those that that kind of like you say the hand up and not out or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah or both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think there's some people that will come for years and years and years. Oh and yeah, just always. Be, oh yeah, and Look, there's some that come yeah. that don't even need it. Like, yeah. Uh, they just come because it's really good food. Like, mm. I mean, you know, mm. it's good food in the cabinet, and, and mm. tonight we can be handing out. I mean, oh, half an hour ago someone paid $12 for the panini, now we're giving it away for free. Yeah. But what we find is that um, there's, amongst it all, there's real genuine people who just want to find a better way. 
Oh, totally. And, and that's yeah. what we want to be able to yeah yeah give. I think there's this story, and I was sharing with you earlier this morning, but there's yeah, a lady, yeah. Tell us this lady that came story. along, and literally, she'd never been to Kairos before, mm. and she heard that we had some nice food, and as you're aware, there's some good food that comes from cafes. Yeah. And, and so um, she decided to come down and have her last supper, that's what she called it, mm. and she had plans to take her life that night. She had it all planned out, what mm. she was going to do. She'd even written letters and different things. Anyway, she came in, she got her food, but someone spoke to her, mm. and it completely disrupted her plans of what she was going to do. Yeah. And and she's still around today. She's very special to us, special mm. lady. And that, for me, is uh, in some ways a hand up. We weren't even oh, intentionally totally. trying to do You're it. You're right. But, but that is where this food that comes from a cabinet that could have gone into a rubbish bin has now impacted a life. Yeah. And, and someone's with us still today. And it's yeah. such a, a touchy subject, but it's just such a, a, a truth of what's happened. Mm. Um, mm. And if I can have a success story every week like that, yeah. <laughs> I know yeah. we're doing the right thing. And that drives me, that spurs me on to, to keep going another day. Totally. Because yep. that's kind of you, in that, in that sense, okay, you were filling a physical need. But also, there was an emotional need, um, and you know, it was sounds like perhaps loneliness or something like that, or just that connection mm. uh, with other people was kind of missing, and that was mm. another sort of area that was um, kind of seen to. Yeah. yeah, Matthew Mark, who was the city mission um, missioner, the, mm. he's just finished, but. He said one day when I was sitting with him, he said, the biggest killer in the city is not hunger, mm. it's loneliness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, so we can provide a space that's safe for people to come to, to hang out with them. And if you come down on a Wednesday or Friday night, there's over 100 people there. Mm. There's little kids right through mm. to older people. And if it's a space where it's non-judgmental yeah. and it's safe for people to come to... Mm. And some of them just come because they want to meet with other people and they, oh, how are you going? You hear little catch-up stories happening down the line. Totally. That in itself is a, a win, yeah. in my view. Yeah. yeah. Man does not live on bread alone. Bread alone. <laughs> sort of thing. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. Yeah. Who said that? Nelson Mandela? Nah, just yeah, kidding. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, or muffins alone. Or, yeah. Uh, or crayons alone. Or sandwiches alone. Yeah. You name it. Um, yeah, <laughs> you put me off, Milton. You put me off my track. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. That's awesome to hear of those um, different kind of stories. Now, you, your wife. I noticed your wife is also involved. Um, who got involved first? Was it you or your uh, wife? Both. Both of us did. Oh, Look, I, was in, I was in uh, the commercial world. I was in sales. Oh, is um, that right? And we'd heard about what Beth was doing, but mm. we sort of. Oh, that sounds really cool, but didn't really yeah. think much more of it. And yep. then, um, long story short, Beth uh, fell in love, moved to Nelson, got married, and um, oh, I see. and there's this thing running. And so we got asked, would you guys like to take over it? But the backstory to that is, after being in the commercial world, commercial sales, and sort of dog eat dog, and someone's trying to yeah, same guy in the country is trying to undersell you, just get a sale. Mm. I mm. just had enough of that rat race, and I yeah, actually yeah. decided to leave. And I had no job to go to. <laughs> I just, um, but I gave quite a bit of notice to that company, and it's mm-hmm. just amazing how everything f- filled out. And yeah. so, for the last three years, we've actually uh, been supported by business people and um, who have supported us financially to do what we've been doing. It's only yep. now Kairos has received some good funding yeah. that we're actually able to take away. So, we've we've sort of cool. been on a journey of not having much money in our wallets, well, and and so probably an understanding for some of these people as well who come. Totally. Um, from that, that side of things, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Because what, um, oh, yeah, so what sort of areas have you received the funding from? To For us? For, or for, for Kairos, for us? yeah. Uh, so Kairos, we've um, sort of, we're not for loss, right, I say, rather than not for profit, because yeah, um, cool. we're actually here not to lose money. <laughs> we're not here to That's make a, a profit slogan. either, but <laughs> we're actually, so often people think, oh, you're a charity, you can do it. You know, cost price and or the lower and things. Well, actually, no. We've still yeah. got to pay to put petrol in our van to pick up food. Yeah, we've still got to pay for the warehouse we use. Yeah. So I call us a not for loss. Um, but there's all the traditional places you can apply for funding to to lots of funding streams. Um, mm. There's you know different foundations and things like that you can apply to for that. We've also had fantastic support from uh, the government over this period. They've mm. uh, 
what happened with the start of COVID as it was under civil defence, and civil defence was funding the food side of things, but as time's gone on, it's moved into mm. MSD. Um, MSD have been fantastic visionaries across New Zealand and some of the setup they've done. Cool. So they set up uh, three big areas yeah. and have funded them. So the first one is New Zealand Food Network. Yeah. On my, on my, on my oh, shoulder. Sweet. Oh, sweet. Um, wow. New Zealand Food Network basically yep. go to all the bulk people across New Zealand, uh, yep. tuners and growers, right yes. through to sanitarium, all those big yeah. places, and go, hey, we're collecting bulk and we'll send it out to you guys to mm. a distribution hub like us. Yep. And then we break it down smaller and send it out to smaller food banks. Yeah. Because a lot of food banks work through a door about the size of your front door. Yeah, yeah. They can't take a pallet of wheat bix. No. They don't need a pallet of wheat bix. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. they could take three or four boxes. And so they'll come to us and pick that food up and then take it back in yeah. their cars. Um, they also set up AFRA, which is Aotearoa Food Rescue Alliance, and I'm on the national board for that. Oh, cool. And what that is, that is basically a resource hub and support centre for groups like us. So basically if we need a new policy about something, we can jump into that um, resource hub mm-hmm. and we can grab out a policy about food safety or whatever and that helps us. We don't have to reinvent the wheel because there's That's other right. groups yep. around New Zealand yep. have already done it, so they yep. upload all their stuff into that. It advocates cool. for us at a national level. Yep. Um, it it just does a whole lot of things like that. And then there's yeah. another area they set up called Hedekai, and that's about uh, food resilience um, and, and a lot of things they've done. For example, if I say I've done... We don't normally do food passes. We're only doing them because of COVID. Yeah. <clears throat> but if I say I've done five food parcels today yeah but food bank over here says we've done five yeah you'll actually find there's quite a difference between the five that we've done and the five that they've done so Kurehitakai set up some national standards of what should be in a food parcel so they've looked at all the dietary needs they've looked at all the what you need as a, in your body and that sort of thing and gone yeah. okay for a family of two adults and two children they need this much milk they need this much cheese, they need this much, and so yep. forth. But they've also given us a guide where they've said, if you haven't got this much milk, you can put this in as a substitute. Mm-hmm. And and so, because when you're rescuing food, you don't always necessarily have milk coming in, say. So you can't put milk in. But yep. what alternatives can we put in yeah. to try and give that dairy intake? Yeah. So from, uh, I know a lot of people knock the government, but I think they've done a fantastic thing of setting mm. those three things up across New Zealand, which will go on for generations, yeah, and have just changed the scape of what we are all working in. No, that's a great story to mm. hear, because I mean, like you say, uh, often we don't hear good things about the government, and it's refreshing to hear that, mm. man, think there are some good things happening coming out of it the, the, coming the, out of Wellington the downside <laughs> of it is you create a reliance yeah so some people become mm-hmm. reliant on what's been offered yeah and this, then when it's yeah. not there and the classic example with that was during lockdown they've started the schools for lunches program mm-hmm. fantastic idea getting kids fed in school good healthy food mm. um but what happened is during lockdown, of course, parents are now not budgeting, not mm. paying for lunches or packing right, lunches right. for kids. Yep. And that was actually happening beforehand, to be fair. That's why they put the program in place. Yeah. So kids get fed well. But some people didn't budget, suddenly yeah. had kids at home during lockdown and didn't have that extra amount of food coming in. So mm-hmm. that created huge strains for families. Yeah. So yeah. There's, there's pros and cons to both sides of it. But in yeah. all, I have to say what they've done is just fantastic, yeah. visionary stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, across New Zealand, the amount of food that is wasted, yeah. we've talked a little bit about that. Yeah. Now there's some good systems in place of recovering it and distributing it out yep. and also making sure it's done safely. Yeah, no, yeah. it's cool. I mean, I'm, it's just, it's good. I mean, something's happening rather than not happening, mm. right? Mm. And I think as, as, we, as you move in that direction, there's always going to be hurdles and things. But um, the fact that you just start moving, because you can change along the way. Thing, things are always probably going to get better. Uh, on the whole um, wow man you've got a lot on your plate how do you guys not burn out <laughs> do, uh, how many is in the team now yeah so we've got I think uh, we've got um, six six seven yep. of us yeah yeah, yeah. Most of us, most part time. Some a couple of us are full time, but it's mm. it's that hard thing. Like any any not for loss, you, you're balancing how much money comes in <laughs> versus how many people you could take on versus using yeah. volunteers and you know, things like that. Yeah. That the hardest thing is that for us is being in the small space. 
we can't have a lot of people in there, especially with social distancing that we've had to follow and things. True. So it's been reliant on us all working that little bit more. But yeah. um, slowly we're starting to bring more volunteers back in, and that's, yep. that's helping as well. I mean, yeah. Uh, trying to think, it, it takes uh, like 15 volunteers a night to run the free store. Right. From your crew on the ground right through to your people serving food, to people collecting food, to if we do the barbecue, people cooking the barbecue. That's a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, it does take a few people to run each night. So um, tell us, I don't even think we've touched on this, where's the location and... Um Yep. So, and what nights and days and stuff yeah, are you right. operating? So, uh, we've got the shipping container that Beth converted into, like it's got sliding windows and you can hand the food out, a little yep. shop sort of thing. Um, that's at 311 St. Asif Street. So, yep. it's just beside the Good Habit Cafe, not mentioning other cafe, but no, just no, as, a, cool. as a, a landmark yeah, yeah. of people there. Yeah. Um, and and so, that's where our trolley run goes out around the city, comes past your cafe, around yeah. a whole lot of others. And we also have a car run each day that goes from there out around the wider sort of Sydney and the wider city yeah picks up the food uh we're open from we're there down there from sort of 4 30 but we open the windows at 5 30 um and we're there till 6 30 wednesdays yeah. and fridays at the moment we hope to get back to mondays it's just been mm. a volunteer um getting yeah. Enough volunteers yeah 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 i was watching on the video and there's a bunch of people called the orange sky team <coughs> Yes. Man, yeah. they're amazing. Yeah, that's really cool. They just started coming, and so they've got a van, mm. and they go and get that van kit out. I think it's about 100k to get a van kit out. Oh, it's it's got, that oh, van just looks so awesome. It's got a yeah. big diesel generator. It's got yeah. two commercial washing machines and two commercial dryers yeah. in the slide sliding door. And then round the back, they've got a shower mm. in the back. So you, the idea is, and they've got dressing gowns and everything, so people yeah. who... Have only got one set of clothes, say. Yeah. Uh, they can go there, they can get those off, get yeah. them in the washing machine. They've got dressing gowns you can put on. <laughs> go and have a shower. And by the time so by cool. the time your yeah. washing's all done, yeah. you get back in your dry clean, dry clothes. Wow. And being commercial ones, yeah. they can do all your um, sleeping bags and your blankets that you might have yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that. So they're uh, apparently in Australia or all over orange the place. Sky. Yeah, orange yeah. sky. Yeah, yeah. Apparently killer. in Australia, they've got um, like pods in the Aboriginal communities and mm. things over there, um, and they've just launched in Christchurch. So mm. we're really excited. Every Wednesday and Friday, they're down with us now, mm. and it just um, it's always been something for me to give a place for people to have showers and things yeah. like that because. It's not just food. The, the, oh, there's no. There's other things yeah. that we yeah. just care for our bodies externally yeah, yeah, yeah. as well as yeah. internally. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. I love Orange Sky. Because obviously, presumably, if it's for people that are homeless, they see a lot of sunsets and sunrises, or, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it's kind of like they're under they're under that kind of And they got a great way. They, they basically get a company to sponsor the build of the van, and mm. then they get another company to sponsor running it for three years. Mm. And they run a lot on volunteers, oh, but wow. do have some paid staff. So, And then they hit about... Sitting down, a bit like us, uh, sitting down with people and talking with people. Yeah. So they have these orange chairs they put outside their vans oh, so that people sweet. can sit and talk. Cause, yeah. yeah. I kind of like cool. the colour orange. I wonder if it was the cycle. I wonder, wondering about the choice of the colour, yeah. the psychology. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. talk but about colour occasionally, eh? So yeah. orange is um, a social colour. Yep, yeah. that does oh, oh, yeah. signify um, something to do with. Um, yeah, communication. But it's got a vibrancy. Like and I think well, so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. It was a, yeah. it was a nice orange. I did a colour yeah. course yeah. yonks ago. It was really random. <laughs> I shouldn't have really been doing it, but I think I was at a loose end, and um, there was someone running it and ended up. Oh, doing I think it. if you got nothing to do, it was like, pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's good to just go and do something random. Yeah, yes. yeah. 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 It just opens up, mate. And also, yeah. you get to meet people. Yeah. But it was as simple as how does that colour make you feel, and we just had to write down how it made us feel and stuff, and then we and then the the um, instructor or whatever. Delved more deeply into the reasons why we feel those things, and did, perhaps the culture. Did you like feel angry for every colour? Angry for every colour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's I've like, developed like, that over time. I think it's <laughs> like um, I heard a, a guy, he's a security <laughs> consultant, ex-police guy, and he said, you know, most groups have crew wear black t-shirts. He said it's the worst colour oh, as a crew yeah. person you could yeah. be. Yeah. You should have a bright colour because. Yeah. Um, it actually black can mm. aggravate and <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Totally. Hey, um, we haven't touched upon the environmental impact of taking food out of the landfill. Yep. So have you? You're kind of. You guys are obviously aware of that yep. because when food goes into landfill, it produces 
a lot of carbon and stuff like that, eh? Yeah, the methane <coughs> gas and all sorts of things. Yeah, look, it's huge. Yeah. And um, some of the stuff, the studies that, like, University of Otago are doing a lot around food waste at the moment. They've got yeah. a lot of students. Um, there was a conference just recently in Christchurch here called Eat Conference where a lot of... Uh, it brought everyone, like, the... Um, I think the Inca CEO guy was there right through to... Um, people like us, yep. and we actually provided all rescued food, which Johnny Swatch cooked up for oh, lunch yeah. for them, and Nadia Lim was co-leading the whole thing, and yeah. it was just brought all people together to talk yes. about all sorts of aspects. Yes. Uh, and one of the, the studies that the University of Otago were talking about there was, and we can pretty much calculate with every kg of food we've done, mm-hmm. we've, we've rescued, mm. uh, it equals a, a 350 grams as a standard meal size, so you can divide that out of your kg. But then they calculate, there's another calculator which carries on down, tells you how much environmental stuff you've done as well right. with it yeah. right down. So you'll see some uh, Satisfy Food Rescue out in Kaipui. Their, mm-hmm. their front page of their website tells you how much food they've rescued, but it also tells you how much they've prevented from landfill and the result of that. So there's yeah. some really cool calculators they've got now. You can see... The difference, yeah, that it, that it can make, you know. Yeah, that is cool because it, it's it's a simple kind of thing, and um, but it has that kind of flow on effect, and it's just doing the right thing. But I mean, um, what was I going to say? The carbon um, footprint. Yeah, it's. Um, oh no, I've lost it. There's yeah. a lot of work being done too um, on uh, potentially charging companies who. Who yeah, have food waste and things. There's the food waste levy and things mm. coming in, and some of our those um, groups I talked about are advocating at government level with um, government departments. And there's a mm. lot of talk going behind the scenes about well, if they donate it to rescue, could they get a tax? You know, um, reducing on rebate that or things, something, rebates yeah. and things. So there's some really, I think, some cool stuff coming out mm. because I, I mean, some people don't care about it, some people mm. do, but I think that. Oh, over, look. over the next wee while, there's going to be a lot more come out that will help people understand that more. I mean, I, the, pr- the more it's all mapped out, yeah. it, it's like it's just like easy information, and you mm. said pe- more the more people understand it better, yeah. and the more prevalent it becomes. Right, yeah, that's right. Yep. Yep. I, I think for me, the biggest shock for me is actually not seeing what foods tipped out. I don't know; it kind of just didn't shock me. But for mm. me personally at home I've been shocked by how much plastic we've got at home coming oh, in yeah. off food mm. so you know when you buy a bag of um, uh, bread you've got the plastic bag mm. but then I just the other day looked in and, and it happened to me a year and a half or so ago I remember really just looking at a rubbish bin and all it was was just plastic waste yeah. off food and yeah. it I think that's been a massive shock to me, and that's why I love with your, your, um, you, you guys just your post the other day. You said about bring a cup in, and you know, and oh, reusable, reusable yep. stuff, and, and we really encourage people to bring containers down to Coros, and yep. we can put that rice salad and things in it rather than yeah, we try not to buy packaging to ship yeah. food because yeah, yeah, we try not to introduce more that's already there. So yeah. that's probably been my biggest shock is about the. The packaging. Things, um, I think there's yeah. a thing. I think uh, this, this might not be true, but in nature, I think humans. This probably isn't true, in fact. But anyway, let's just roll with it. Um, I think that um, humans are the only people creatures that kind of produce waste that doesn't get used by another animal. Mm. And and I mean, when we're landfilling stuff like wasted food, I mean, other other animals and stuff produce waste, but it becomes something else for someone else. Mm. Um, Whereas humans, we produce stuff which isn't useful for any other kind of organism on Earth, like plastic, for example, and these landfills. Like, it's creating heaps of gas and stuff, and I don't know. I mean, there's, there's some clever things, like they're yeah. crushing the glass yeah. and using that to make the green on the cycle waste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is some pleasure in this, yeah. but I, yeah. think, I think plastic is probably the worst one, because... Yeah, you think even like a packet of bacon, you mm. open your bacon up. Yeah, I know. And that plastic ain't going to go anywhere in any, any time soon. No, you know? that's right. Um, or, or the classic thing is people go and buy toys from Kmart, they're just full of plastic, and in weeks they're broken, and then they end up, you know, like it's not just food wrapping and stuff we can no. talk about, but there's a lot of other yeah, yeah, waste. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, there's, there was a story about a, a, a guy that, over the whole year, he only had one supermarket plastic bag full of waste, uh, yep. plastic from his. I don't know how he did it because, but it's finding, I suppose, the places like the butcher that will wrap your stuff in paper yep. and things like that. It's yep. finding, finding that sort of thing that 
and um, just taking your own stuff along, like yeah. your own reusable bag mm. to get it. Like yeah, and there's a shift. A lot of supermarkets now, you mm. I don't know, you can take your container and they'll put your weigh it and then put your fish in and then yeah, you know, and things like that. So you, there is some shift towards that. But yeah, it's not. It's not. It's convenience, isn't it? Yeah, totally. I think we're we're more aware of it now as a family because my wife insists that we recycle our soft plastics. And once you start kind of recycling, you realise how much you're producing. Mm. And I don't think recycling is always the best answer. Like, to if we could cut it out altogether, um, that would be a better kind of solution, eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah full on. Um, I've I've had a couple of friends who've been homeless. Um, and one of the big things is washing. What we were talking about before, mm. you know, and they would. Um, they'll just come up with all sorts of resources maybe stash a bucket away in the woods or you know, like have a sponge bath and all that sort of thing so they're like really clever in the solutions that they came up with mm. <coughs> I, was at, I was at the camping show at the weekend the caravan show just went to have a look and they now got for $95 a unit about oh, slightly bigger than your saucer that's got suction cups and it's USB and so you get your bucket of water Stick this inside the bucket with the suction cups, USB powered. Yeah, and it's, it turns that bucket into a washing machine, so you can put your undies oh. and things oh, wow. in there, and a bit of soap, and it just like yeah. backwards and forwards really fast, and the whole thing's just swirling around. Yeah, like like it's a yeah, yeah, great, yeah. I mean, not so good to wash your sleeping bag and things. No, but, but fantastic for just those small things. Oh, yeah. yeah, no. A, a friend of mine, he would like um, you know wash his undies and stuff, and like just in public toilet. And, yeah. Have a, you know, find maybe a um, like a wheelchair toilet, and have a bit of room, and that's their home. That's their yep. that's their nice place for a moment. Mm. Mm. And I think that's where Orange Sky saw that, and they're like, we can create a really cool little wee space for these guys mm. to come, and mm. you know they can do it winter and summer because they've got lights and all that sort of thing on their van. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. But I tell you this, a couple of people I know, man, some of the solutions they come up with, yeah. but it was over time. It's like over a year or two. They'll like develop it mm. and work it all out and talk with other people. They were really clever. Like, there's a guy I know, he lives in a tent. Um, he's actually not in at the moment, thankfully, with the winter, but over summer, he lives in a tent and he lives, he's got a piece of bush over near the Port Hills. I won't say exactly where it is. Yeah. But, but he literally packs it up every morning, gets yeah. up at five in the morning, packs it up and stows it under a, a flax bush. Yeah, because if the rangers and people see it or mm. neighbours see it, they'll complain and then yeah, it'll get yeah. all taken off him. Mm. But he and then he get back there just as it's going to dark, mm. put his tent back up, and just even him talking about what he was putting underneath him to sleep for insulation, like he'd get different things, like he'd get cardboard and then he'd put a layer of like pig that, that they, they they wrap the pallets up with. He'd find that in the supermarket. Oh yeah, oh, the yeah. bubble wrap stuff. The bubble wrap and oh, stuff like that, and layer that, and then more cardboard to insulate himself off the ground. And oh, that's yeah. a great idea. He he would get. A, he got a 10 litre paint bucket speaking about washing and he would um, put his stuff in there he wanted to wash and he got a bit of washing powder he'd find soap um, the squirty soap off the wall and things put it in and then he'd swing the bucket around 10 ways oh. and 10 the other way as an agitator <laughs> and he'd tip it out and he'd get yeah. more water from the river and wash you know rinse his clothes out and yeah. then he'd hang yeah. them up but he said he kept getting the clothes nicked like um, people would walk through and see them and stuff he had, the hardest part was drying the stuff but yep. my friend that happened to him as well yeah he would um yeah, to get his clothes nicked and things, but he'd have these sort of stealth washing lines. We sort of stealth camping, and he would do the same. He would um, get up before normal people woke up, and so you know, to them they don't, you know, the stealth camper doesn't exist, mm. or the stealth hobo or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Do you think there are more homeless people around town? Uh, is it a growing kind of problem? I'm not right on the pulse on it, but I know what happened with COVID and lockdowns is. is they did a fantastic job. A lot of agencies got together from the police through mm. City Mission and others, uh, Drug Arm. A lot of agencies worked together mm. and got a lot of people off the streets before lockdown and put them in motels. Now, yeah. some of them have now gone on and got into houses because yeah. they was able to shift so that just cycle. That first step. Yep. I think there's a lot of, uh, not necessarily people sleeping on the streets, there's a lot of people sleeping in cars. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people sleeping in vans and there's yep. that, that, that people that just cannot afford rent. Mm. And I think that's a bigger probably mm. just from what I'm seeing and hearing from somebody. We've got people who, who come to us and, and, and like in a van and they've got no number plates on their van. It's not yeah, even registered yeah. and warranted, but they're driving around. Mm. Um, but that's their home. Yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. What happens when the. Because um, I also know people who've 
sleep in cars and they know like if you get busted for that now it's it's potentially a 400 buck fine I think Mm. think the the council does its rounds at 5am and (coughs) whoa really yeah but what does that those people also learn where to move on and where to park and not park and things like that true true but throwing like that it's kind of like we're trying to it doesn't help them, it, but it doesn't help does give it? them no. 400 dollars like, fine they're yeah. already struggling it's not going to achieve anything more yeah. so you're going to stop it whereas and it's, it's a bit like I know a guy he, he's got some medical conditions so one night we had to call an ambulance and he's literally having this medical condition he's telling us don't call the ambulance because he mm. knows he's going to get charged mm. for the ambulance ride to the hospital yeah, yeah, so the yeah. very person who needs the ambulance is saying don't call it and and he was in huge debt to St John's mm. because he needed an ambulance. And I just think that's fundamentally wrong yeah. where someone, and like there's people in the car, find them, but it doesn't really achieve anything to actually helping them. And no. to me, it's like this crush down on people, you know, yeah. rather than recognise that's a group that actually needs help. How can we get them help, get them through that? Some people are there by choice and you'll mm. never shift them, you'll never change them. Yeah. But other people are, are just... Um, stuck there because of whatever's happened whether it's bad choices they've made or mm. they've just never been able to get above that cost of living whatever it might be you know? yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah and then having that fear on top of that of um isn't gonna um promote kind of positive change is it mm. it's kind of man I, that would suck that would be the last thing you'd want mm. and if you're in that like vulnerable kind of situation mm. so what kind of things can you see like that could be that could we could change or do better um, to help our vulnerable members of society? Like, are there any kind of areas which um, you can kind of imagine a better future? <laughs> I mean, obviously, you're doing a lot, Stuart. Yeah. Don't, um, don't feel I think bad. You can, only, only, you can only do so much. But I think, especially in the season that we're in with uh, the financial hardship, yeah. um, but I don't think that just throwing money at it helps. The no. same like throwing yep. free food. It yeah, doesn't yeah. actually help. We, we, I mean, how do you solve the world in sixty seconds? You, you can't, yeah. can you? Sorry, but, good question. <laughs> but, good question. But, but I think that housing is <laughs> affordability is a massive yeah. thing. But you know, cost of materials. You know, last night hearing these business people I was with, that developers and things, and they're sharing on. You can't even get stuff, and if you can, it's going up two hundred percent. And some yeah. places are issuing daily price increases. Yeah. And whether some of that's beefed up more than, I mean, imagine if your mm. coffee supplier was issuing you a daily price increase on your on yeah. your coffee. Yeah. You know, yeah. how to, just the whole affordability. And I just, I don't know. It's just, but, that's just a. No, nah, it freaks yeah. me out as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. I just ordered a 20 kg bag of flour yesterday. Yeah. Not long ago, it was, I think it was $19.50 like wholesale. Yeah. Now it's $27. Yeah. $27.50 or something. Yeah. Same with 5 kg bag of cheese. It's now sixty-seven dollars. It was fifty dollars a couple of months ago. Oh, we're, we're in our new building, we're looking at having to get a sewer pipe put in so we can have some toilets and showers. And we're talking with the Orange Sky about mm. putting some pods in. And so we're looking at working together and things. But potentially, that sewer pipe would have cost ten thousand dollars. It's now fifteen. That's what the, the drain layer was telling me. Oh, and right. he said that's only in the last four months. That five thousand dollars increase. Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. just it's like that alone. Yeah, you know, like that's a huge cost. That's oh. that's quite an expensive pipe to put some yeah, waste down. I reckon. You know, so uh, then you go back to the mum and dad and mm. the, the sports fees and the all the mm. different things. You know, yeah. it just I don't know. It, it's just sort of feels like it's all at you. It is. But it, it is, is quite, quite a high pressure thing. Just, just yeah. Got to make wise choices, and if you don't know, to not be afraid to ask. You know, yeah. the, 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 you guys have thrown some one liners out. I'll throw one out. You know, the stupid question is the one that's never asked. Right. Find someone you trust and mm-hmm. ask them, hey, how do you budget? I mean, one of the things I did in the last three years for us personally is I actually got an Excel spreadsheet. Now, I wasn't that good at it, but mm. I, I learned through a job how to do Excel spreadsheets. Mm-hmm. I can now tell you how much it costs me to live a day down to the dollar yeah yeah and it's actually quite scary when you go back up that list and look at all the different things you pay out to live mm-hmm. um, but when you break it down you go it cost me that much to live a day it cost me that much to live in this house a day it cost me that much yep. to own a car and and so it gave me understanding yeah 
and I didn't have that, so I was kind of like just spend every year. It's great, yeah, and I had yeah, a job yeah. that I could do that. But yeah. when I went into the period that I was in the last three years, I couldn't do that. Yeah. So it gave me understanding, but it was people who also helped me. You know, I, I gave that yeah. spreadsheet to someone I trusted and said, "Hey, have a look at this. Have I missed something? Because mm-hmm. it seems really expensive to live." Yeah, yeah. And they're yeah. like, "No, no. You should actually add in this, and you should add in this." And so they added more in yeah. than what I actually had. So. I, I've now used that spreadsheet with some people. I'm not a budgeter, no, and I encourage yeah. people to go and see a budgeter. <clears throat> and there's some fantastic free services in Christchurch that can help people who just want to understand what it costs to live. You know, mm. that, that's a great idea. Punching it in on the um, Excel spreadsheet. Mm. I might do that because I use a bit of paper. Mm. I'm, trying, I'm trying to work on budgeting myself. Mm. Um, <clears throat> like even at the cafe, like just the small things they add up so much. Like say. So I just spent ten dollars on bread for like one week, so it's, so it doesn't sound much, right? Mm. But in one month, that's forty bucks. In one year, twelve four, twelve fours, that's mm. almost five hundred dollars a year, yep. and it's something you don't even think about. And our lives are just full of little bits and pieces like that, and mm. it adds up to thousands and thousands of dollars every yep. year. And that's the great thing about a spreadsheet is you can have different columns. So some things I know how much they cost a week. Mm. Some things I know only how much they cost a year because it's a yearly bill for some insurance on the car or something like that. So yeah. you can have different ways of putting it in the columns, but it can still break it back down to monthly and down to weekly. <clears throat> and then when you're on the phone to an insurance company or you're comparing insurance company to insurance company, my wife every year she goes through and looks at the best internet company and the best power company, and, and she knows what is the best one to use and when other companies can't ring up hey we've got a really good deal she goes mm. but you can't beat this deal and yeah. she has a bit of fun with them on the phone but, <laughs> but because she knows she's found the best deal yeah and, and yeah, so totally. so this is some skills we've learned ourselves yeah, we yeah, can yeah. help other exactly, people with yeah. because it's not IP or anything I'm not making no, money yeah, out of it yeah. But I, I think that's, going back to your question, well, that's where we can help other people and yeah, that's where yeah. you, can, you can focus on the doom and gloom and everything's so expensive, but you can go, actually, here's a way to understand it. Here's True. a way to find out about it. And the beautiful thing about that spreadsheet now, it's not anything weird about it. I can take all our columns out mm. and I can say, here you go, mm. load the, your numbers in. You know? mm. There's that thing again, is that just that little bit of, of empowerment, yep. just another little bit of empowerment instead mm. of another stressor. It's something... We can take a little bit of control of. Yep, that's um, right. And we can just do that little bit by little bit. It feels, it feels good. Yeah, the other thing that I just thought about then, you know, we had some people, and you, you might laugh about this, you may not, there's, there's two stories here, but what, one story, um, someone they literally brought the pasta, lasagna pasta pieces back and said, your chips are off. <laughs> They're really crunchy. <laughs> but what these people had no idea is they yeah. did not know that you needed to cook them. You did need yeah. not know need to put yeah. them in hot water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from that, I started to learn uh, that some people have wow. no cooking facilities. Yeah. yeah. So how do you tell someone like that that's got no cooking facilities what to do with pasta? Yeah. So this is where when you give someone a food parcel, it's full of food, and often we find food parcels dumped on our door at Kairos because they've gone through taking out what they know or what mm. they can use, mm. and they don't want the rest. And often mm. in there's things like kidney beans, mm. uh, cannelloni beans, mm. pasta, rice, things like that. And I've, I've met some guys that don't know how to cook rice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need it's another collection from, <coughs> from the homeless people who've left this stuff. Yes. Yeah. It's like another collection. Yep. So, so that, that's sort of one story in itself. People didn't yep. know what to do with pasta. Yep. Yeah. And, and, and we do laugh at it, but it's sort of... As we can send that reality. back to the cafes. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me in Sione's, in Sione's wedding, that movie, um, there, was, uh, there was a scene about um, the biscotti, which we make here as well. Not our biscotti, yep. obviously, but um, biscotti. And the guy was like, nah. The, I think he said, these biscuits are stale. Or, yeah. um, oh, man, what, you know, I don't want a stale biscuit. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other thing, like one night, so this is another story where we've given someone a hand up, but... We had a gas heater, you know, one of those gas heaters about sort of chest high. Yeah. We're standing around it, hands around it, and this lady came up, and she was really well-dressed and really well, like, good woolen clothing. Like, mm. she wasn't just like some people in t T-shirts saying it's cold. No. But she was really well-dressed, really well wrapped up. And she had, um, who put her hands up, she said, oh, a heater. Mm. And me and my naiveness said, but don't you have a heater at home? Yeah. She said, oh, no, I can't afford to run one of those. Yeah. 
I said, what do you mean? Like, you, you live in a house, and I talked to her a little bit, fleshed it out. Yeah. What had actually happened is a chimney had fallen down in the earthquakes. Right. She got lost in the system. This is 10 years after the earthquakes. Yeah. Got lost in the system for getting her own heat pump installed. Yeah. Because they were doing the yeah, EQC and things. Yeah. So anyway... I said, look, leave it with me. I connected her to a budgeting company, a service, who mm. actually knew other people in the home heating thing. Mm. They found out she's eligible for a heat pump. She paid $42, was oh, wow. her piece. Yeah. And three weeks later, she had a heat pump installed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she still yeah. comes down, and she, I said, how's your heat pump? And she said, it's wonderful. I yeah. don't use it much, but yeah, when yeah, I yeah. use it, I... I, yeah. I yeah. So she was protecting her finances, looking after yeah. her money, not wanting to plug a big, sucky power heater in. But... She had no heating in her house. And yeah. I think we can sometimes yeah. so easily judge a book by its cover and we get it so wrong. Yeah. And I got that so wrong. Why mm. don't you have a heater in your house? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but that's, to me, that's a hand up. Through the food, we've met her, and now she's better off than when we <coughs> met her originally. Because mm. she's one of these outliers who have slipped through the cracks. Mm. Yep. Um, yeah, it's real fascinating. Mm. And it's just a thing. And, and didn't know how to advocate for herself. Mm. That's all this heat. Um, the, the heat energy centre or whatever it was advocated for her back to EQC saying she's been missed mm. but she didn't even know who she could go to to ask because it's help. just too overwhelming right yep. just what the hell's all the system about you wouldn't have a clue where to start mm. yep. mm. and you get stuck in there and it's a mind thing and it just goes round and round and then you don't feel good enough and then you don't feel like anyone wants to help you and it just yep. that, yep. that spiral you know yep. but if you've got a relationship and you can go bounce ideas around with other people and find out more information. That's the starting point, eh? I've been, uh, when I've been cool. to other events in New Zealand with other food rescue groups and things, some groups are going, how do you know so much about your people that mm. come? Yeah. And it's like people are actually really ready to tell you what's yeah. going on Yeah. if you just stop and listen. Yeah, if you've got the time. And that's, yeah. the, that's the key thing I really try and get a lot of our volunteers to do mm. is just come and listen to the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they talk about all sorts of crazy things, but other yeah. times you actually hear them really talk about what's going on in their life. Yeah, exactly. And there's some trigger words you can hear and go, okay, would you like, hey, look, I know someone who could might be able to help you. I don't know, they might not, but would you be interested in having a chat with them? Mm. And so it's a gentle introduction to someone else or another group that can help. We do, we do food rescue, we don't do counselling, we don't do budgeting, we, no, we, but we do that, but we're a yeah. link in that process. Yes, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, thanks, Stuart, for coming in um, and sharing everything that you've shared with us. Um, it's really cool to hear all those stories. Thanks for having us. It's been cool. a pleasure. And, um, thank you, as you guys, for what you do in the part of the circle and, and, and the food that you do have left over. You know, we never ask cafes to make extra food. It's mm. only what you've got left over. So yeah. thank you, you guys. For your, you're part of these stories because your food has connected those people. Yeah, yeah, cool. Mm. No, pleased to be a part of it. We're, we're, yeah, it's awesome that it exists that we can do that. Um, and thanks, Richard, as well. Yeah, thanks, yeah. <laughs> Sweet, cool.